I'd like to welcome you all to the Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. My name is Donna Blankenbaker, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this session. I just want to remind everybody to sign into Poll Everywhere. And at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce your speaker for this webinar, Dr. Rena Patel. She's Assistant Professor of Musculoskeletal Imaging in the UCSF Department of Radiology. She completed her residency at the University of Chicago and her musculoskeletal fellowship at UCSF. She's been on staff at UCSF for the last five years and is the program director for the musculoskeletal fellowship for the past four years. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Blankenberg, for that introduction. And thank you to the SSR and the Resident Education Club for inviting me to speak on this topic, which is very close to my practice, I'm sure close to yours, how to perform an image-guided joint injection of the hip. So as mentioned, we're gonna be using Poll Everywhere um, throughout this presentation. So I just wanted to start with an introductory question, make sure everything is running smoothly, and also so I can get to know um, you and the audience a little bit better. So how many image-guided hip injections have you performed? Are you a junior resident? Maybe you haven't had the chance yet, or you've only performed one. Maybe you're a senior resident and you've performed more than one, but not quite a pro yet. Or maybe you've done so many that you've stopped counting. Let us know in the poll. All right, so we have some answers coming in, a little bit of a mix. Um, so a few, it looks like a few juniors and a few seniors, so that's great. Um, great to see that many of you have had the opportunity to do these hip injections. And I did suspect that um, quite a few people have had done these before because it's one of our most common procedures we do in radiology, in musculoskeletal radiology, whether it's by ultrasound guidance, like you can see here, or fluoroscopic guidance. And both of these joint injections were for placement of steroid or anesthetic into the joint to help treat hip pain. And that's one of our most common indications for performing these hip procedures. So I'm going to focus on steroid and anesthetic injections for this talk, um, discuss the indications of these injections, the risks of the procedure, as well as medications, and then some step-by-step -step technique. And then of course, I'll um, touch briefly on arthrograms, another common injection we do in the hip, and very briefly discuss some alternatives to steroid injections. So let's start with this case, the 77 year old patient with right hip pain. You can see from the radiograph why they have pain. Um, there's osteoarthritis here with joint space narrowing and osteophytosis. And this was a patient in whom conservative measures were not working, so a corticosteroid injection was requested. And this is a very common presentation and indication um, for the procedures um, that are sent to us. Because osteoarthritis is so common um, worldwide and hip is one of the most commonly affected sites. And joint injections are just one part of the treatment options for osteoarthritis. So usually patients um, are instructed to either um, use exercise or physical therapy, plus or med minus medications to help control pain. And if these conservative measures fail, then the patients are referred to us in radiology for image-guided joint injections. And then of course, we have all seen patients who have more severe osteoarthritis or severe pain who eventually go on to get arthroplasty. And I think it's helpful to understand what our role is um, in this treatment algorithm because oftentimes our patients are asking us questions about um, osteoarthritis in general, and also about the efficacy of these injections compared to other treatment options. And this is one of the questions I get very frequently. Um, our patients often ask, how long will pain relief last following the steroid or anesthetic injection? What can you tell your patient? What's the typical length of pain relief? Is it a few hours, a few months, at least a year or several years? So again, please let me know in the poll. So a lot of people going for the few months, which is exactly correct. Um, so corticosteroid injections are very effective treatment of symptomatic pain relief, but in the short term. 
So if you look at the um, effects that are described out there, it typically wanes around three months. And if it is just short-term symptomatic pain relief, what do you think the consensus is on recommending these injections? Well, if you look at our colleagues in rheumatology, like the American College of Rheumatology or the AAOS, both of these national societies strongly recommend the use of corticosteroid injections in helping treat hip pain related to arthritis. Differs a little bit um, with some other societies. If you look at the European Association for Rheumatology, they don't specifically endorse these injections. And similarly, the Osteoarthritis Research Initiative um, do not recommend these injections just based on lack of strong evidence compared to other treatment options. However, those of us who've done these procedures know how effective they can be for symptomatic pain relief. And of course, it's supported by a lot of literature out there, as well as our um, colleagues in rheumatology and orthopedic surgery. So next, I'm going to talk about risks of performing um, these corticosteroid hip injections. And before you perform any procedure, you want to make sure it's appropriate to do so in your patient. So what's an absolute contraindication to performing image-guided steroid injection of the hip? Is it abscess at the site, warfarin anticoagulation, heparin anticoagulation, or fall risk? So again, please leave your answers in the poll. Right, so a lot of quick answers here, um, a lot of correct answers. So abscess at the site is the correct answer. Of course, if there's infected soft tissue over the area you're going to be going in, you don't want to track that infection down to the joint. Now, anticoagulation is not actually a specific absolute contraindication to performing these procedures, and I'll touch on that a little bit in a moment. With fall risk, you know, we do want to be cautious when performing procedures in patients with fractures. So fall risk alone is, of course, not an absolute contraindication. So image-guided hip injections are generally very safe. When we're consenting patients for these procedures, our consent is going to be very similar to um, that of other radiology procedures. So we're going to warn them about pain during the procedure, potential for bleeding, as well as the potential for post-procedural infection. As I mentioned, anticoagulation is not an absolute contraindication for hip injections. There's a lot of studies out there that looked at um, patients who've gotten these injections on therapeutic anticoagulation and generally very safe. And if you look at the Society of Interventional Radiology Consensus Guidelines, joint procedures are considered in that low risk for bleeding group. So definitely a potential, but low risk. Same with post-procedural infection. There's varying reported incidents of septic arthritis following these procedures in the literature, but if you look, all of those incidences are very low. And then, of course, we perform these procedures with appropriate sterile technique, which really helps maintain that low risk. So there are other risks that we should be mentioning when we're consenting these patients, and it's important to think about patient-specific risk factors. So what about this patient, 63-year-old, has diabetes mellitus, what specific risks should we discuss with this patient? And I'm going to make this an open-ended um, question because I want to see what your responses are. If you want to text your response um, into poll everywhere, we can see what people are um, think we should discuss with this patient. Right, so infection is a good, um, important to discuss. I see a couple of other responses popping up very quickly. And a few that I'm um, seeing stick out are hyperglycemia and blood sugar levels, as well as glucose. Some of these words are in a different order. Um, but of course, in addition to infection, we want to talk about um, hyperglycemia. And there are a few papers out there that show that blood glucose levels rise following intraarticular corticosteroid injection. We think when we're doing these injections that the effect is mostly localized to the joint, and that is true, but there is some systemic effect. And in patients with diabetes, you will see a rise in blood sugar, or blood glucose levels. And this review in JBJS looked at some characteristics of this hyperglycemia. And I think one of the interesting things to note is that these peak levels can occur somewhere anywhere between two to five days post-injection, sometimes up to seven days. 
one important thing um, that came out of this review is that there were no reported cases of ketoacidosis, so no serious um, complications of that hyperglycemia. However, it is important to caution our patients with diabetes of that risk so that when they are measuring their blood glucose levels, they're not taken by surprise. And they also understand the importance of monitoring their levels throughout the week following the injection, not just immediately after. So what about this patient? This is a 63-year-old with right hip osteoarthritis and pain. Um, they're coming back for their second injection, but they were concerned about their last injection experience. They noted they had a lot of pain following the procedure. So first thing that's important to do is look at the images from the prior injection. This was an ultrasound guided injection. You can see here that curve of the femoral head, dip of the neck, and our needle. You can see the needle track all the way down to the needle tip, which is on a good location at that femoral head neck junction. So this does look like an appropriately um, positioned uh, injection. So you wanna go back and ask a few more details about their concern. And they tell you that a few hours after their last injection, they had really severe pain. Um, it persisted for a few hours into the next day, but then slowly resolved after that day. And they didn't have any concerning um, features like fever or joint warmth or swelling. So what do you think was happening with this patient? Was there severe pain related to septic arthritis, CPPD arthropathy, steroid flare, or anaphylactic reaction? So what do you think? Okay, so a lot of you guys um, are pros out there. Um, many of you are answering the um, correct choice, which is steroid flare. Now, of course, infection or septic arthritis um, could be potentially a concern, but they did have some reassuring um, uh, lack of symptoms like no fever and the pain resolved on its own after a day without them having to do anything. So that really points to this potential complication of steroid flare. And if you look at the incidence of steroid flare, it's fairly uncommon. Um, the reported incidence varies, but usually less than 10%. And it's characterized by pain um, occurring hours to a few days post-injection, thought to be mediated by deposition of corticosteroid crystals within the joint, which inflame the synovium and causes localized inflammatory reaction. And some of our patients describe that they have actually worsening pain a few hours after their injection. But then what's great is that steroid does start to kick in, help reduce that inflammation. And so overall, this is a self-limited process. The pain and inflammation will decrease over the subsequent days. But I do caution um, our patients on that possibility of steroid flare, as well as what to look out for that would be concerning for um, a more uh, serious complication like infection. All right, this is another interesting potential complication, very uncommon, but this was a 61-year-old with right hip pain. They had this initial presenting radiograph in August, not really severe osteoarthritis, but the surgeon was concerned that the hip was the source of the pain and they asked for an uh, image guided hip injection. We did this under ultrasound. Again, just to orient you, we see this echogenic brown femoral head, that curve of the femoral neck, and we can see our needle going right to that spot at the femoral head neck junction. So it does look like an appropriately positioned injection. And the patient did have pain relief. Um, but unfortunately, they came back five months later with worsening hip pain. The surgeon ordered a radiograph and we see this result. So if you look, pay attention to the joint space, you can see a big difference from just August to December in the amount of joint space narrowing. It's almost bone on bone in December. So what do you think is happening here? I didn't turn this into a poll every question just because um, this is what I suspect is happening and there is a little bit of controversy around this diagnosis, but I think what's happening here is rapidly progressive idiopathic arthritis or rapidly progressive osteoarthritis of the hip, which is characterized by rapid progression in joint space narrowing within a short period of time, so within a year, and this was within about five months. And we do see this occasionally after intraarticular steroid injections, but it's really not clear what the exact mechanism or the risk factors is, are for this process. 
Now, again, I want to emphasize that hip injections are very safe, but it is important as someone who's doing these procedures to be aware of these uncommon but severe complications. And that includes the potential for rapidly progressive arthritis, osteonecrosis, insufficiency fractures as well. These have all been reported after intraarticular injection. But what's difficult, it's not quite clear which patients are at risk for these uh, severe complications. So ultimately, we need more studies to better understand and characterize this risk before we um, and, and able to give some risk stratifications to our patients. So I know I've spent a lot of time on um, risk of the procedures, again, emphasizing these are very safe, um, but it's important to understand the potential risk, just not just the basics of pain and potential infection as well as bleeding, but also going beyond into the potential for um, hyperglycemia, steroid flare, and then a few other complications I didn't mention yet, including allergic reaction. Whenever you're injecting anything, um, you there is a potential for allergy to that medication. And then there are some specific um, a potential risk related to steroids, including soft tissue atrophy and hypopigmentation. However, these two risks are more commonly seen when we do superficial injections, like maybe around the ankle or hands. The hip is deeper, of course, and so less commonly seen with that. Um, and then uh, patients who have steroid injections can sometimes experience nausea, vomiting, and flushing. It's important to describe that as well. And then, as I mentioned, keep in mind that there is potential for severe complications, but understand that we need further study to better understand the risks of these severe complications. So let's get into techniques, starting with medications. So when you're doing corticosteroid injections, it's usually a combination of steroid and anesthetic. And the choice of steroid and anesthetic will vary from institution to institution. I listed a few of the common ones here. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on is you may have heard that the, there is possibility of chondrocyte toxicity related to anesthetic. It has been reported um, with intraarticular injections of anesthetic. Although the um, cases where it's been reported, the dosing and the time of exposure, or length of exposure, varies somewhat from what we're doing in radiology. So it's less common with the lower doses that we're using in radiology. And then, of course, you can. Um, decrease that in a possibility even further by using preparations without epinephrine. In addition to the steroid and anesthetic, if you're doing these procedures under fluoroscopic guidance, you will also need some sort of contrast to identify that you're in the um, joint itself. And most commonly we use iodinated contrast. So you can see this contrast pooling around the femoral neck. But what about cases where you can't use contrast? So for example, a 67 year old with right hip pain, they've scheduled that fluoroscopic guided joint injection, they show up um, to your clinic ready to get their injection and they tell you that they happen to have a severe allergic reaction to iodinated contrast at an outside hospital. So they sort of catch you unawares. Um, what can you do for this? patient? Do you tell them, sorry, I can't do this procedure today? Um, or is there a modification that you can do to help um, get this patient's injection done um, during their appointment? And again, this is an open-ended question. Just wanted to see what um, people are doing out there. So I see a couple, uh, at least one response. Um, so someone mentioned air. Any other responses, or maybe everybody is on board with air, which would be great because that's exactly what I'm getting to. Ultrasound. Ultrasound is a very um, important alternative and um, I think very useful to think about. And depending on your institution, you might be able to just move them over next door to ultrasound. Unfortunately, um, we have some locations where there's only fluoroscopy available. And in those cases, air is a great um, alternative to iodinated contrast. So air is a common negative contrast. Here in this patient, you can see the needle tip at the femoral head neck junction. If we look on the next image, I'll show you that again. On the next image, you can see this lucency around the um, femoral neck right here, right in the area that you would expect to see iodinated contrast. So this is using air as negative contrast to confirm intraarticular position. And this is something we can do for steroid injections to help confirm we are in the joint. 
I will say that I only practice with adult patients. Um, it is important to be aware that there is a reported risk for air embolism when air arthrograms are performed in infants. Um, but that's if you are also practicing with pediatric patients. If you're doing this in adult patients, they are a well-known and safe alternative to iodinated contrast. So let's go into step-by-step -step technique. Um, starting with fluoroscopy. So patient coming in with left hip pain, they have a fluoroscopic guided injection order. So what to order? So what do we do to prepare? So we've already done your informed consent. Now we need to gather our materials for the procedure, including our sterile materials, as well as a few other specific items, including syringes for the lidocaine and the steroid, as well as the iodine contrast a 22 gauge spinal needle, usually about three and a half inches, although you might need a longer needle in the patients who are larger habitus, and then a 25 gauge needle for your local anesthetic, your lidocaine. Then we also use tubing with the contrast to make sure when we're injecting and confirming our intraarticular position that our hands are outside the field of view. So you've set up your table, you've got the patient ready to go, what do you need to do in terms of positioning? So when performing a fluoroscopic guided hip injection, what position do you put the patient's leg in? Neutral, internal rotation, external rotation, or abduction? Right, so most people um, get the rotation. A few uh, mixed response, but majority for internal rotation, which is correct. Um, so you do want to have the patient in an internal rotation, meaning the feet sort of toes touching. Um, when the patient is in that position, you can see the greater trochanter is a little bit more lateral, and we have a nice clear view of our femoral neck. That's opposed to external rotation when the feet are sort of splayed out. The greater trochanter overlaps with our femoral neck and obscures our pathway. Which brings me to my next question. Where do you target your needle for fluoroscopic guided hip injection? Um, and this is where you want your needle to land, not necessarily where you're starting or where you're marking on the patient, but where do you want your needle to land? And this is a question where you can click. So perfect, I see some people clicking already um, and we have a great grouping um, in the area exactly where you would want to be. Uh, maybe you want a little bit lower, but uh, Generally, most people are in the correct spot. So um, we want to target at that lateral femoral head neck junction um, because this is the spot where the hip joint space is capacious and allows us to um, freely inject into the joint space. So you can mark on the patient's skin either two spots. So you can do the direct straight down approach where you're marking right over the spot you want to end up at, or you can do the ob oblique approach. And that direct straight down approach, you're moving your needle essentially perpendicular to the table so that your hub is projected right over your needle tip. And if you think about it from a cross-sectional point of view, you're just going straight down from the skin to that lateral femoral head neck junction. And the oblique approach, you're marking out more laterally, usually over the greater trochanter, and moving your needle in oblique fashion medially and deeper until it gets to that same location at the lateral femoral head neck junction. Again, thinking about it from a CT or cross-sectional point of view, marking out laterally and then moving in obliquely. So you've consented and marked, you've done your sterile prep and time out. What are your next steps? Well, you wanna of course numb up the skin with some local anesthetic. Then you're gonna advance your needle to the bone, whether it's that direct approach or the oblique approach. Then confirm position with fluoroscopy and a small volume of contrast. And what we want to see is this free flow of contrast, usually flowing down around the femoral neck or up around the femoral head. And these are some examples of appropriately um, positioned intraarticular contrast. Here you can see some contrast flowing away from the needle. Here sort of around the head as well as the neck. Um, and here as well in the same position, also moving down distally around the femoral neck. As opposed to these cases where we weren't exactly in the right spot, you can see contrast pooling around your needle tip. Or in this um, situation, you can see a little bit of striation. This was probably within the muscle. 
And in these cases, you'd want to move your retractor needle and move it back into a better, a more appropriate position and check again and make sure you see that free flow of contrast. One thing to keep in mind whenever you're doing these injections is if you aren't having any difficulty injecting any resistance, that might be a clue that you're in the incorrect spot because when you're in the correct location, it should flow freely into the joint. So there are other locations that um, contrast can flow um, if you're in the incorrect position. And this was a case where um, we weren't quite in the right spot, then the needle tip was moved and we ended up in intra-articular location. But here you can see the results of our initial attempt. And where do you think that initial attempt was? Where is that contrast highlighted by the red arrows? Is it intra-articular, intravascular, inguinal canal, or iliopsoas bursa? Right, so it looks like almost everyone is going for iliopsoas bursa, and that's exactly correct. You can tell you're in the iliopsoas bursa because you see this longitudinal flow of contrast um, sort of vertically up towards that femoral head and joint. In this case, you'd want to reposition your needle. Here we moved a little bit more laterally, and you can see that free flow of contrast around the femoral neck. So iliopsoas, inadvertent iliopsoas bursa injection is not uncommon, um, especially since the iliopsoas tendon and bursa are in such close proximity um, to the femoral neck. But what you want to do is, again, look for that free flow of contrast. And if you don't, you want to reposition your needle. So we've confirmed you're in the right spot. Uh, the rest of the procedure is downhill. You just need to inject your steroid and anesthetic. Again, when you're injecting, you wanna make sure that that injectate is flowing freely into the joint space. And then of course, once you're done with the procedure, we remove um, the needle, place a bandage, and make sure the patient is um, feeling well and doesn't have any symptoms of nausea or dizziness. So this is sort of a step-by-step -step of fluoroscopy. Let's go move on to ultrasound guided injection. And this is going to be a little shorter discussion because there's going to be a lot of similarities between ultrasound and fluoroscopy, starting with the preparation. This consent is going to be very similar, and the preparation is going to be very similar as well, although, of course, you don't need contrast, but you do need a sterile probe cover, and the positioning is going to be very similar as well. But you do need to make some ultrasound specific decisions like probe choice. Um, this hockey stick probe and this 9 megahertz linear probe are both probes that we use in MSK ultrasound, but one is a little bit better suited for our need for a hip injection. So which one do you choose? All right, so you guys are great at answering these questions. Um, everybody chose the 9 linear, and that's exactly correct. And if you think about your physics, um, the higher frequency probes have that shorter wavelength, great for looking at superficial structures. The lower frequency probes have longer wavelengths, better for looking at uh, structures that are a greater depth, like the hip. And of course, the footprint is different. The hockey has a much smaller footprint, great for looking around the ankles and fingers. The nine has a much larger footprint, great for looking at larger structures like the hip. And I just chose the nine linear because I had a picture of it, but you can choose a probe um, anywhere between about five and 12 megahertz. That will give you the adequate depth penetration you need for these procedures. So once you um, choose your probe when you're um, positioning, you want to place the probe at the anterior hip parallel to the femoral neck. This is one of our sonographers. We drew this sort of outline anatomic picture of the hip. And you can see here, this is the general location of where you would want to have the probe. And you can see it's slightly oblique. I tell our trainees, think about positioning it towards the umbilicus or the contralateral shoulder. That will help you get along the parallel to the femoral neck. And that will give you an image that looks like this. So again, if you don't do a lot of ultrasound, I'll orient you. First. So this is our acetabulum. Here we have that curve of the femoral head that dip down to the femoral neck. This patient had a little bit of fluid in their joint space. Um, so you can see that uh, echogenic joint capsule just above. And I've already shown you some examples of hip, um, ultrasound guided hip injections. So you probably know that what we're targeting, very similar to fluoroscopy, is that that femoral head neck junction. 
So for the step-by-step -step of ultrasound guided hip injections, again, very similar once you make those decisions with probe choice and marking, of course, wanted to do consent, still prep and time out, then you do wanna give some local anesthetic. And we're gonna advance our needle to the bone. And with ultrasound, it's gonna be in an oblique fashion towards the femoral neck, uh, just like you see here. And we wanna visualize our position of the needle tip at the femoral head neck junction, in addition to getting that tactile feedback of feeling the needle on the bone itself. And you can see here on this cine clip, um, the position of the needle as well as the needle tip. I'll play that again. So here's our needle landing on the femoral neck, confirming that intraarticular position. What's great about ultrasound is you can also visualize while you're maintaining and uh, while you're injecting your steroid. So you can maintain visualization of the needle throughout the procedure. And uh, if you're have uh, lucky, you can see this injectate flowing freely into the joint space. So that was um, an overview of corticosteroid injections. The last few minutes, I'm gonna to touch on um, arthrogram as well as some steroid alternatives. So arthrograms, I'm not going to go through all um, indications for MR arthrogram or um, uh, show you cases because we had such a great uh, lecture at the previous resident education club. But just as a reminder, MR arthrograms can be helpful for evaluating cartilage injury, labral tears like in this patient, or for post-surgical evaluation. The preparation is going to be quite similar in terms of materials, although of course, instead of steroid, we're going to use contrast, so iodinated contrast and gadolinium contrast. And when preparing your contrast mixtures, it's helpful to keep in mind the concentration that you need of gadolinium. So what concentration of gadolinium should you use for an MR arthrogram? Um, you have a 20 cc c syringe. Um, what, how much uh, how many cc's of GAD do you put in that 20 cc solution? Is it 10, 5, 1, or 0 0.1? And sorry if it's cut off a little bit. It's Again, this is 10, 5, 1, and 0 0.1 at the bottom. All right, so mixture of responses, although majority did have the correct response, which is D, 0 0.1 cc's in a 20 cc solution. So if you look at the concentration that is ideal for giving you that hyperintense appearance on T1 sequences, it's between one and 100 to one and 250. And just to make the math easier, um, I choose the one and 200 range, which uh, equates to 0 0.1 cc's in 20 cc syringe. And what's in that 20 cc syringe? Well, that mixture might vary a little bit, but I can tell you mine, it's a 10 cc saline, five cc iodinated contrast, and five cc anesthetic like lopivacaine into which I put 0.1 cc of GAD. Like I said, that mixture may vary in your institution. In some um, institutions, they may only do saline and anesthetic. They may vary that concentration of saline and anesthetic and have iodinated contrast in a separate syringe. But the important thing is to keep in mind the concentration of GAD that you need to get the, um, your best images. And of course, the procedure for doing a hip injection for um, prior to arthrogram is gonna be very similar to that for steroid injection, you're gonna mark in a similar fashion, either oblique approach like you see here or the direct approach. Um, you're gonna give local anesthetic and advance your needle to the bone and confirm your position with a small volume of contrast. I inject a very small amount just to make sure I'm definitely in the joint before I inject the rest of my mixture, which usually will range between 12 to 15 cc's of that dilute gadolinium mixture. So the last few minutes, I'm just gonna end with touching a little bit on um, therapeutic alternatives um, to corticosteroid injections. So I talked a lot about using corticosteroids to help treat um, symptoms of hip pain, um, but there all are alternatives that you can do um, for hip injections. And if you look at recommendations out there by our colleagues, AAOS and ACR, the, the rheumatology ACR, um, what do you think their recommendations are on management of hip pain? Um, do they recommend hyaluronic acid, PRP, dextrose, or none of the above? Right, so most of you picked none of the above. 
And that is correct. And I know none of the above questions um, aren't ideal questions anymore, but just wanted to give you a sense of sort of what's out there and what's officially recommended because there are a lot of options um, that have been described for treatment of osteoarthritis-related hip pain. And just to um, give you a little background on all of these um, visco supplements or higher acid preparations are thought to help pain from osteoarthritis by providing joint lubrication and shock absorption. PRP or platelet-rich platelet -rich plasma thought to um, decrease inflammation via cytokine modulation among other things. And prolotherapy or injection of dextrose, um, among other irritants, thought to create a targeted injury or inflammatory response in the joint, which then stim stimulates wound healing. So all of these things have been described in literature, but just as of yet, those studies on their efficacy, particularly compared to corticosteroid injections, is limited. And for that reason, they're not officially recommended by colleagues in rheumatology or the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. I will say that there are studies showing efficacy of hyaluronic acid preparations for treatment of pain related to knee osteoarthritis, but the data on effectiveness in the hip is limited. However, these are performed at other institutions or your patients may be aware of these alternatives. And so that's why I think it's so important to still be aware of the possibilities out there because you may get patients asking you about these alternatives. So in summary, just a few key points that we covered. Image-guided hip injections are a very common procedure and safe procedure. It's important, even though it is a very safe procedure, to recognize the potential side effects, including things like steroid flare, hyperglycemia, and also be aware of this possibility of uncommon severe pathology um, that can be associated with intraarticular steroid injections. Also important to understand proper technique um, so that uh, you can have a safe and accurate injection and recognize potential pitfalls for fluoroscopic injections, recognize when you're not in the joint, um, as well as things that you need to keep in mind when you're performing these procedures by ultrasound guidance. Right. Thank you very much for your attention um, this evening or afternoon. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that great talk. Um, very nice review and beautiful images. Um, so at this point, we're going to open this up for Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. And we have a bunch to start with. Um, so the first question is, when do we use fluoro guided guidance instead of ultrasound guidance? Right. That's a great question. You know, at my institution, we actually do both. Um, for guidance um, and ultrasound guidance. And I think there are some advantages um, to uh, one in certain situations. Um, I know with um, uh, ultrasound guidance can be very helpful um, when our patients are having a hard time um, staying still in the position we need to be the, have them in with internal rotation. Ultrasound is a little bit more flexible in terms of patient positioning because we're visualizing that femoral neck very well and we can visualize our needle tip to the um, point where it's getting to the joint space. But um, otherwise we do uh, do perform these procedures in, with both modalities. Uh, we're, we do the same pretty much. Uh, most of it actually for us is under fluoro, but we do a subset uh, just depending. And sometimes it's how quickly we can get patients in. Maybe they can get in quicker under ultrasound versus fluoro. So that's sometimes of how patients are routed. So it's, it's very much the same case for us as well. So it's nice to have both options so we can get our patients in as quickly as possible. Yeah. Our next question is, what is the ideal dose of corticosteroid and what is the maximum dose? That ideal dose, well, in terms of most commonly used doses, I mentioned some various preparations out there um, in terms of brand names, uh, things like um, Kenalog um, and the Metro are the most commonly used um, that I'm aware of. And um, usually about 40, one cc, so 
40 milligrams per milliliter, so about 40 milligrams of each of those. I know in some locations they also do 80 milligrams of the depo preparation. Um, and I haven't really seen that many studies comparing one versus the other. Uh, so for us, at least, it really depends on our referrals. So some of our referrals prefer that we inject Kenalog and some have no preference. We pretty much exclusively use Kinlog and we only do one ML as, as well at the 40 milligrams per milliliter. So yeah, it sounds like most of us are doing the same thing. All right, um, do you use PRP in your practice? Why or why not? And if so, what type? Leukocyte rich or poor? That's a great question. Um, I we do not do PRP in my practice and um, that's partly related to our referral base. So it's not something that our um, surgeons are really on board with yet, at least at our institution. I know that um, sometimes our patients ask us about it, um, but um, as of yet, it's not really something that we are doing for intra-articular injections. I'm not sure um, how it varies at other locations. Yeah, we're not, we're not either at this point. And I know some places, um, some of the sports medicine centers are doing it. So, yeah. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> Another question, are there alternative positional techniques that can be used if the patient is having a significant loss of passive range of motion or pain with internal rotation, such as FAI? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we do encounter that some of our patients when they're there for fluoroscopy have a really hard time maintaining that internal rotation position. Um, and I'm not really aware of alternative positions on fluoroscopy. Um, however, when we are doing these procedures under ultrasound guidance, having that internal rotation is less vital for us. We are able to do these procedures um, if the patients are still in external rotation, again, because we can maintain visualization of that femoral neck. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Even if, you know, under fluoro, sometimes, you know, we do a lot of our aspirations of the hip and patients come in and there's so much hip pain that will end up, they'll be in kind of a flexion position of their hip and you can get in there. It's just being really patient, take your time and you can act and still use the same landmarks. It just, it's not the perfect situation that we like to show at meetings, but I would still try the same techniques. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, no, I agree. Same thing when you mentioned aspiration. Um, we've had many situations like that where the patients are in flexion. And I agree, using um, your anatomic landmarks and going a little bit slower, sometimes we're uh, checking our needle position a little bit more frequently than we usually do um, when the patients are in internal rotation. Um, but uh, we are most of the time successful in getting into the joint space still. Another question, can you also do CT guided intraarticular hip injections? Is the femoral neck also the same target for that injection? Uh, so I have not performed these under CT guidance um, and certainly you could use CT guidance. I think the reason I have not, or um, most institutions probably have not, is because we are successful majority of the time with ultrasound or fluoroscopy. Um, but if you were to use CT guidance, I would probably target in the same location. Yeah, I think I would too. Um, we uh, rarely have we done it, and the more it's for an aspiration and for some unusual reason that we are gonna aspirate somebody under CT. So you're right, if we use fluoro or ultrasound, but yeah, I would if you if that's the only thing you could do it under, then yeah, I would I would do it the same way. Um, another question is what are some tips to reduce air for arthrograms? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I didn't mention that in the technique, but of course, when you're doing arthrograms, you want to reduce the amount of air you're in general, like minimal um, so that you're not seeing it on your MR images. And um, one of the uh, techniques we use is when we're in connecting our tubing, we make sure to put a few drops of our contrast into the hub before we connect it. So it's sort of a wet connection um, and that can help uh, minimize uh, introduction of air. 
We actually do a similar technique for ultrasound as well, because we don't like to have air obscuring our needle on ultrasound. And so um, we do that sort of wet connection um, technique um, for ultrasound as well. Do you ever find it helpful under ultrasound when you're getting close prior to getting into the capsule to inject a little bit of anesthetic and then get into the joint? Have you tried that and is that successful? Yes, so with ultrasound, um, you can uh, have, um, we'll have like two separate syringes. So one with our anesthetic we're injecting into the joint and one with the steroid and injecting a little bit of that anesthetic first, making sure you see free flow of the anesthetic um, can be very helpful to confirm, just additionally confirm that you're in the joint before injecting the steroid. I'm going to ask my own question about the, these on, on arthrograms of, and just for all the attendees that are attending today. Um, are you, do you ever inject steroids during your hip arthrograms? Um, and if so, what is your technique? What do you prefer? And how do you uh, do that's that? A that's a great question because I do know that um, I have um, spoken with other people at other institutions who do this. Um, we do not get really simultaneous requests um, to do both at the same time. Um, I think probably in my experience, I've only done like a handful. So I don't know if I have a great specific technique or great advice on doing this since I, I don't do them routinely. I don't know. In, in, your in your practice, you do. Yeah, we we get asked all the time, and that's why. And and, and so I there's kind of like three algorithms that I always teach our you know, our residents and fellows, uh, and all of them are correct. It's what you're the most happy with. And so one of them is to mix up your cocktail like you normally do, push it out, you know, get rid of the fluid down to 12 cc's, pull up a cc of steroid, and then you inject into the joint. The other alternative would be, which I'm not a big fan of, is you pull into that whole cocktail, you pull up two cc's of steroid but, and because then you, you're diluting it, but then also you're charging the patient a big chunk of change for that steroid, so that I'm not a big fan of it. Then the all other one, which a lot of people like, is you pull up your one ml of steroid in a separate syringe, you start the injection, everything's going well, you unhook, but this is where you have to be very careful about introducing air. Then you chase in the, you put in the steroid and then you hook back up your 20 ml syringe and then finish the injection. So a lot of people in the end like that the best, but those are, there's a lot of alternatives. They're all right. It's just whatever. <laughs> But yeah, we have a big volume of our sports medicine docs. We see a lot of our athletes that they want steroid in there as well. Excellent. Um, all right, another question. It says uh, intraarticular gadolinium for anything except wrist arthrograms is pointless and does not offer any imaging advantage. What is your opinion? Well, I know that again, opinions are vary from institution to institution. I will say majority of our hip MRIs are done without contrast, even in our post-operative patients, um, but that is our surgeon's preference. So we have um, some hip surgeons who are very comfortable with our reads that we get on our non-orthogram images. However, there are occasions in which um, we do get uh, orthograms it's just not as common in our institution. So um, I do appreciate um, that uh, feelings about this may vary from location to location. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, you know, we do all our hips without contrast, but actually even in the orthopedic literature, they actually realize it in the hip arthroscopy meetings that in the post-operative patients after hip preservation surgery, everybody is more comfortable because they're looking for adhesions, other things that are very important to get the diagnosis correct on those post-operative patients. So yeah, that can be, that can be difficult. Great question. Um, another question, what is the total volume you inject for intraarticular steroid injection and for the arthrogram? So I think we kind of um, dealt yeah. with any other comments? We kind of touched on that. 
Yeah, with the 12 to 15 cc's for the arthrogram. And of course, with the steroid, we do one cc of the steroid. And then you can do a very about amount of the anesthetic. We sort of do between two to five cc's. Yeah, we inject, we used to do up to 15. And what we found was a lot of our patients are uncomfortable. Now we really were at a 12, 12 ml max um, injected if we're going to do that. <clears throat> Um, I have a question for you um, talking about um, patient, you know, the elderly patients that are coming in to see you um, for these uh, therapeutic injections. You know, we now recognize that you can see rapidly progressive osteoarthritis after we inject uh, steroids into the hip joint. Are you informing them in their, your consent process about the potential of this, you know, developing subchondral insufficiency fractures? What are you doing at your place? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think such a challenge um, to approach because although we want to appropriately consent our patients, we also, um, I think, want to give them the best risk assessment. Um, and, you know, I don't want to scare patients away from a procedure procedure that is generally safe, especially when the risk is not that well understood. Um, and so as of now, we aren't um, routinely consenting for that risk. Sometimes our patients do ask about that um, rapidly progressive arthritis because we have very, um, you know, uh, patients who are very with it in terms of uh, medical awareness. And so they do ask us, and that's why I think it's so important to understand what the current literature is so we can at least have that discussion with our patients, but um, we don't routinely do so. Um, what do you think is the most common issue that residents run into when performing hip injections for the first time? That's, um, so we, we do, uh, um, all of our procedures are done by trainees. And so there are some um, situations that we run into when I'm uh, um, supervising our trainees. And I think when you're first starting, um, some of the um, issues that might run into is, are not necessarily knowing exactly when you're to the joint space. I feel like that's one of the biggest things when I ask the resident, okay, are you on the bone? And they say, yes, I always go in there and check and push it down a few more millimeters because they're almost always in the soft tissues like the joint capsule. They're feeling that firmness of the joint capsule and they stop. So we have to go in a little bit further. So that's probably one of the most common um, issues that um, our junior residents run into. Um, what type of cases do you find most challenging by fluoroscopy? I think some of this we um, discussed a little bit already in terms of positioning. I think our patients who have a difficulty with um, the internal rotation um, or sometimes our patients who are um, slightly larger body habitus, it can be a little bit challenging um, by fluoroscopy. I think ultrasound is a great alternative in terms of patients who have difficulty with positioning. And then I think our patients who are slightly larger body habitus, of course, ultrasound is not going to be that helpful. But um, with those patients, I think, again, it's important to keep in mind um, your basics. So keep in mind your anatomy and your marking and try not to deviate too much from that because um, I think sticking to your basics and your routine will help you get into the joint. Great. You mentioned about visco supplementation, hyaluronic acid injections. Now, are you performing them at your institution? We aren't doing them for the hip, although we have on occasion done these for the knee, but not, not for the hip. Same, same kind of thing. Um, we actually do a lot for the knee, occasionally if we're asked to do it for the hip, but I know I don't think it's FDA approved except for the knee. So, so it's exactly. an thing, yeah, so. There are some um, reports and discussions out there, but again, uh, I think uh, not approved for the, the hip. Um, and uh, I think great, we have some great responses from patients in terms of knee injections, but um, not yet the hip. Right. Well, I think that's all of our questions that we've received. So Dr. Patel, I wanna thank you again for this excellent review, um, just very outstanding in the questions. I want to thank the audience for attending today's uh, lecture and for your participation.
Um, I do want to mention, and there was a one comment of how often do these occur? They, these um, excellent lectures occur every month. The next uh, lecture will be on March 8th. Uh, so next month, not too far away. It's going to be a little bit later at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And the topic is going to be commonly missed fractures of the foot and ankle, which is going to be presented by Dr. Karen Chen. So make sure you sign up. You don't want to miss it. And again, thank you, everybody, for your time this, this evening, this afternoon, everybody. Thank you all. And also a reminder about the survey that's in the, the chat as well. So um, please um, give us your feedback on um, this webinar. Perfect. Thank you.